Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And this week, we're going to be studying 2 Nephi, chapters 11 through 19. And I have to say that I'm very pleased to see the change in the Come Follow Me schedule compared to four years ago in 2020 when we studied the Book of Mormon. In that year, they just lumped all of the Isaiah chapters into one week's lesson, chapters 11 through 25. And that was a bit frustrating, just too much to do in one week and especially the Isaiah chapters, which we're going to talk about here in a minute as to why they particularly should deserve our time and attention. And these chapters are powerful, important, and inspiring. So I'm really happy to see that they split that previous lesson into two parts. And I plan to take full advantage of that extra time given this year. My goal is not just to help you plow through them, or endure them, or skip over them. I want to help you to love the Isaiah chapters, because they are phenomenal. They are so relevant to our day. Like everything else in the Book of Mormon, there's a reason they're in there. And I want to help you to see that reason. But first, a reminder, teachers, if you're interested in accessing the materials that I put together to help teachers reduce their preparation time, increase their confidence in the classroom, and create edifying classroom experiences, go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to those resources. If you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For an object, for this first part of the lesson, I would bring in a number of tools from home. Uh, A hammer, a screwdriver, a wrench or two, and just lay those tools out at the front. And we're going to come back to that later. Then for an icebreaker, I sometimes like to introduce the Isaiah chapters with what's called a magic eye activity, like this one. And I ask my students if they can tell what this is a picture of. And many, at first, are just going to say that it's a picture of nothing. That's not true. There is a real identifiable image in this picture. And I tell them that I'm going to try to help them to see it. Now, it doesn't work as well on a big screen. So I usually print out one of these for each class member and let them try it for themselves. And if you've never seen one of these before, it just looks like a big mass of splotchy colors with no meaning, no image in it. But if you know the secret the right way of looking at it. There is actually something to it. It is a picture of something. And the secret is to stare at it and allow your eyes to just relax until your fields of vision just kind of cross. It's a little hard to explain. Sometimes it helps to put the picture right up to your face and then slowly move it away and then let your eyes relax. But when you do that, a 3D picture emerges from the image. It's really cool when you can get it to work. So this one is actually a picture of two hands reaching out to each other with the word trust written above it. To me, that's kind of like the Isaiah chapters. At first glance, they may just seem like a jumble of meaningless, difficult-to-understand words, names, and ideas. But if you know the secret, if you know the right way to look at them, it's amazing. They're cool. They're powerful. And Nephi felt that way about Isaiah's writings, too. That's why he includes so much of them here in 2 Nephi. And I want to ask you how you would fill in the blank in the following sentence. Honestly, with your true feelings here, how would you complete this phrase? My soul blank the words of Isaiah. 
some possible answers I've heard in the past. My soul is confused by the words of Isaiah. My soul skips over the words of Isaiah. My soul tolerates the words of Isaiah. My soul can't stand the words of Isaiah, or my soul questions the words of Isaiah. A lot of possible ways to, to finish that sentence. But how does Nephi fill in that blank? Check 2 Nephi chapter 11, verse 2. Nephi's soul delighted in the words of Isaiah. My prayer is that by the end of our study of the Isaiah chapters, in these next two weeks, that you're going to be saying the same thing. Using the scriptures, I want to first help you to understand why these chapters should even matter to us. Why study Isaiah? Nephi and Jesus are going to help us to answer that question, not me. <laughs> so as a teacher, here I number my students off from one to four and invite them to look up their assigned verse and find and mark any reasons for why we should study Isaiah. So first, in 1 Nephi chapter 19, verse 23, the number ones are going to look this one up. Studying Isaiah will more fully persuade you to believe in the Lord your Redeemer. Isaiah has a lot to teach us about Jesus and why we should and want to believe in him and follow him. So look for Christ in the Isaiah chapters. He's there. And we're really going to look at that message about Jesus next week. Also in that verse, studying Isaiah will be for your profit and learning. When you make a profit, you're getting much more out of something than you put into it. You make a profit. What a great way to describe studying Isaiah. Whatever amount of effort or study that you put into him, you're going to receive back more than you put into it. Uh, it will reward you fourfold, at least, as you learn. 1 Nephi nineteen twenty four, Studying Isaiah will give you hope. The message of the Isaiah chapters is a hopeful one. So keep an eye out for that message. 2 Nephi 11, 8. Studying Isaiah will cause you to lift up your hearts and rejoice. Not only does it bring you hope, but happiness as well. And then we're going to go all the way to 3 Nephi chapter 23, verse 1, with perhaps the most compelling reason to study Isaiah. Because Jesus commanded us to. That's I think that's a pretty good reason not to ignore Isaiah. A pretty good reason to spend at least two weeks with him here in our Come Follow Me study. How, how are we doing as a church on that one? Are we keeping that commandment? I hope we're trying. <laughs> and then look what Jesus says. He says, great are the words of Isaiah. That's a quite a compliment coming from the Son of God. Jesus wants us to study and hearken to the words of all prophets. But how many does he specifically single out like this? He's like, this prophet, you really need to study him. His words are great. So hopefully uh, you're convinced now that the Isaiah chapters are important for us to study. And I have a few more things for you to consider. 35% of the book of Isaiah is found in the Book of Mormon. And if all of Isaiah's quotations from the Book of Mormon were moved into one place and just called the Book of Isaiah, it would be the fourth largest book in the Book of Mormon. And then I have a question for you. If God knew that we would already have the Book of Isaiah from the Bible to study from, why would he include so much of it in the Book of Mormon? It's kind of like duplicate information, isn't it? Couldn't we have 
pretty much gotten the same stuff by reading Isaiah in the Bible with the help of the JST? My answer to that question? By putting so much of his writings in the Book of Mormon, it almost forces us in the latter days to take him seriously, to focus on his writings like he commands us to do in 3rd Nephi. If there were no Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, do you think we would study him that much? I mean, how much time do you spend studying Jeremiah or Ezekiel? Without the Isaiah chapters, he'd probably get about as much attention as they do, which I'm afraid isn't much. So I'm grateful that Isaiah's writings are in there and we get them twice in our study of the standard works. Now our next question, how do we study Isaiah? Like the magic eye activity, is there a more effective way of looking at these chapters to understand more of their meaning. Well, I'm going to let Nephi teach you how. He does just that in the first portion of 2 Nephi chapter 25, at the conclusion of the Isaiah chapters. So I know that that's a chapter that makes up part of next week's lesson, but I just think it makes so much more sense to start with them here first, because this is where Nephi really comments on understanding the writings of Isaiah and what made it easier for him to do so. Well, that's where I'm going to take you now. The first thing I'd like to do is give you a few tools for working with the words of Isaiah. You and I know that certain jobs require specific tools to accomplish a project efficiently and successfully. And this is where I would point to the tools that I set out at the beginning of class. We're going to do a brief review of Nephi's top seven tools or suggestions on how to get more out of our study of the writings of Isaiah. To engage my students in that study even more, I might give them this bookmark activity for them to fill in Nephi's seven suggestions as we go. You may even want to print it on cardstock so that it will last longer for them. They might even decide to use it as a bookmark as they study the words of Isaiah. Um, have it there as a ready reference as they go. We're going to go ahead and fill this in together now. Just look at how Nephi begins his commentary. He acknowledges that Isaiah is a little tougher. He says that even his people found Isaiah's words hard to understand is kind of comforting. We're not the only generation to struggle with Isaiah. These were people that were much closer in time period to his writings. But he also tells us the reason why they struggled with them. And I, I think it's the same reason for why a lot of us struggle with them. It's because they knew not concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews. What does that mean? What's the manner of prophesying among the Jews? It's poetry. It's figurative, symbolic language. I know I mentioned this back when we studied the book of Revelation, which Isaiah and Revelation are two very similar kinds of books. God, apparently, likes to use imagery and metaphor to teach his people. So if you want to understand Isaiah better, approach it like you would poetry. Don't look so much for the literal as much as the metaphorical, the allegorical. But when he presents you with a symbol, stop and ask yourself why he would choose to represent that idea with that object. Be prepared to approach Isaiah the same way that you would Shakespeare or Dickens or Wordsworth. It's serious poetry and needs to be read slowly, carefully, and deliberately. So Nephi's first suggestion to seeing Isaiah, know the manner of prophesying among the Jews. Nephi's second suggestion comes in verse four. Isaiah's words will become more plain to you 
if you are filled with the spirit of prophecy. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> you might say, I'm not a prophet. Do I have any hope? Yes. John tells us what the spirit of prophecy is in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, do you have a belief and testimony of Jesus Christ? And if you do, and you seek the spirit, Isaiah will be far easier for you to understand. So be sure to have a mind and heart open to the spirit while you seek the savior on every page. Suggestion number two, tool number two, seek the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus. Tool number three is at the end of verse five. He says, there is none other people that understand the things which were spoken to the Jews like unto them, save it be that they are taught after the manner of the things of the Jews. Tool number three is to be taught after the manner of the things of the Jews. It really helps if you have an awareness of their history, their culture, their geography, their religion. The better understanding that you have of that background, the better able you will be to know what Isaiah's message is. And no, you don't have to have a degree in ancient Hebrew studies to appreciate Isaiah. But you should do a little bit of homework to to get your bearings. And I'm going to help you with some of those things here. But the church has provided manuals and articles and the Bible dictionary to help you to understand some of the things of the Jews that, that you would do well to understand. And let me give you briefly a, a basic understanding of the setting of Isaiah's writings. I think even just that little bit of information is going to do wonders in helping you to comprehend a lot of what you'll be reading in the Isaiah chapters. The house of Israel at this point has been divided into two nations. They've split. And you have the ten tribes of the northern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel, which is sometimes referred to as Ephraim. And then you have the kingdom of Judah in the south. And Isaiah is living at a time of great military threat. It's a, a threat of war setting. And there are three major threats that the kingdom of Judah is going to face during Isaiah's time as a prophet. The first threat is a confederacy or an alliance of the kingdom of Israel and Syria. Then, Threat number two, uh, Syria. And then three, Babylon. Well, Israel and Syria are not going to succeed in overtaking Judah. And Isaiah reassures them that the real threat is not Syria, but uh, Syria. And uh, Syria is going to come in and destroy the northern kingdom and carry them away captive. That's how they're going to become the lost ten tribes. It's because of that attack. But Assyria is not going to be able to take over Judah. The people are going to humble themselves, and they're righteous, and they're going to trust in the prophet and King Hezekiah. They're spared Assyria's attack. And, and a quick suggestion here. You really should read that story in 2 Kings. It's a really phenomenal story. Maybe if you've been studying with me over the years, you'll remember that, uh, that lesson that we had. Uh, but maybe this would be a good time to go back and review those chapters, the story of King Hezekiah. Uh, but, but Isaiah is then going to warn them that the real threat, the biggest threat that they're going to face is Babylon. Babylon is eventually going to be the kingdom that will overtake Jerusalem and scatter the kingdom of Judah. And that's why the Lord warns a certain prophet named Lehi to flee into the wilderness with his family. So that's a very, very oversimplified setting for the Isaiah chapters. 
But I think that even that much is going to help you to grasp the message a little bit more. All right, tool number four comes in verse seven. In the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at the times when they shall come to pass. So the suggestion here is to look for fulfillments of prophecy. So when Isaiah speaks of the mountain of the Lord's house being established in the tops of the mountains, ask yourself how that may have been fulfilled. When he speaks of an ensign being lifted up to the nations and an army answering its call to go out and conquer, ask yourself how that might be fulfilled. When he speaks of establishing a vineyard with a fence and a building a tower in the midst of it, ask yourself if and how that prophecy has been fulfilled. Isaiah's writings are there to help instruct us about the latter days. That's part of what makes him a bit difficult. Isaiah speaks about his time, Christ's time, and our time all at the same time. So there's, there's a reason that he's doing it that way. And now we've got Tool number five in verse eight. I know that they shall be of great worth. Isaiah's words. I know that they shall be of great worth unto them in the last days. For in that day shall they understand them. Nephi tells us that we in the last days are going to be able to value Isaiah's writings more because we'll have a better ability to understand them in the last days. And I think the reason for that is because we have so much more help and resources available to us to understand his writings. We've got all kinds of prophetic commentary to help us, manuals that explain and clarify. We've got the study aids right there in our scriptures, the footnotes, the chapter headings, the Bible dictionary. Use those things. We really don't have much of an excuse not to understand Isaiah's writings. The resources are out there. Resources that previous generations had no access to. For us, they're right at our fingertips. And I promise that if you'll use those things, you're going to better understand the words of Isaiah, and they will become of great worth to you. Now, we are going to leave 2 Nephi chapter 25 here, and tool number six is all over Nephi's writings. He's going to say something again and again. To help you see this, I'm going to put all of these verses up at once, side by side, and you tell me what phrase or suggestion they all have in common. What is Nephi's, and by the way, there's also Jacob in there. <laughs> he, he, he's quoted here too. What are their number one suggestion for studying Isaiah? Do you see it? And it's to liken his words to yourself. Seek to find personal meaning in the Isaiah chapters. Look for its relevancy to your life. How does it change you, how you act, what you believe? Compare Isaiah's time to our time and heed his warnings and counsel. If these writings don't change us in some way, then maybe we're not, we're not reading them in the correct way. Tool number seven, the last suggestion comes from the Savior himself. And it's from a verse that we already took a look at. But how does Jesus suggest that we study Isaiah? What adjective does he use? Or adverb? Diligently. Study Isaiah diligently. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes pondering. It takes digging which, which leads me to say that really the best way to study Isaiah is verse by verse. Right? Because if you skip around, you are going to miss some of the meaning. But that's not realistic when it comes to teaching Isaiah. 
we've got limited time as teachers. So the best thing to do, I think, is to pull out some of the major themes and big picture ideas with the hopes that it inspires our students to go out and study them verse by verse on their own. And that's what I'm going to try to do for you here. We can't cover it all, but allow me to pick out and point out some big ideas and themes. So here we go. <laughs> Lesson number two, the game. And uh, uh, the object that I would bring in to introduce this would be a chessboard. And I would set that up at the front of the class. For an icebreaker, I like to give my students the following challenge. I'm a big fan of the game of chess, the classic war game of military strategy. And if I have any chess enthusiasts out there, can you solve the following puzzles? I've got an easier one and a harder one. Here's the easy one. White to move and mate in one. And figure this one out. What, what move does white make to win the game? And the answer is to move this rook to the following square. Checkmate. Now the harder one. Try this one out. And here, what you're going to do is move this pawn forward, which allows you to promote him. But you wouldn't promote him to a queen, as you usually would do in that situation. But if you promote that pawn to a knight, that ends the game immediately. Checkmate. Well, remember that I told you that Isaiah wrote his chapters at a time when the kingdom of Judah was under military attack. And just like the game of chess, in war you have attacks, offense, defense, a winner, and a loser. That's how I like to approach the Isaiah chapters, with those themes in mind. This war strategy. We're going to liken their situation to ours in the latter days, because we too are under attack. We are on the battlefield of life, the great chess game of life. And who is our opponent? Satan, of course. <laughs> and you can liken yourself to the kingdom of Judah being under attack from an enemy. Remember, I gave you that little bit of historical background. They're living at a time of military threat. So are we. Just kind of a, a different kind of threat. A spiritual attack. And I'd like to give you a broad overview of what we're going to see, these different aspects of this conflict, and the scripture blocks that you can read to see these themes. We're going to be covering these themes over the next two weeks. So we have Satan's attack, 2 Nephi 12, 7 through 8, 2 Nephi chapter 13, and 2 Nephi 15, verses 8 through 25. Our defense in 2 Nephi 12, 1 through 5, and 2 Nephi 14, verses 5 through 6. And then we've got our offense. 2 Nephi 15, 26 through 30, and 2 Nephi chapter 16. Then we've got the winners, 2 Nephi 21, verses 6 through 16, and 2 Nephi chapter 22. We've got the biggest winner, right? 2 Nephi 19, verses 1 through 7, and 2 Nephi 21, verses 1 through 5. And then we have a description of the losers. 2 Nephi chapter 12, verses 9 through 22, and 2 Nephi chapter 23. And then the biggest loser, 2 Nephi chapter 24. We're going to start with Satan's attack. See if you can complete this matching activity. 
a lot of the problems that the kingdom of Judah are having are spiritual problems, problems that we still have today. Satan has started to get a hold on their hearts. So read each verse and match it with the problem that they're having. And as we go, we're going to be likening the scriptures to ourselves, like Nephi suggested we do. With each match, we should ask ourselves, does Satan still use that same attack in our day? And if he does, how does he do it? Here we go. Second Nephi chapter 12, verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. The answer is F. Materialism. They're obsessed with riches, silver, gold, treasures, and, and having more and more of them. Is that a problem in our day? Definitely, right? especially in my country, the United States, and other first world countries. Second Nephi chapter 12, verse 8. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands that which their own fingers have made? The answer is K, idolatry. Now, we may not struggle as much these days with worshiping statues, right? But an idol is anything that we place before God. I mean, I, I do find that phrase interesting. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Kind of goes back to materialism there. Uh, money is an idol. Uh, success is an idol. Worldly success. Popularity is an idol. Our own appearance can be an idol. Power is an idol. I believe that idolatry is just as much of a problem in our day as it was back then. It might just be manifested a little bit differently. But we as people tend to worship the work of our own hands. Second Nephi 12 verses 9 through 12. And the mean man boweth not down, and the great man humbleth himself not. Therefore forgive him not. O ye wicked ones, enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust, for the fear of the Lord and the glory of his majesty shall smite thee. And it shall come to pass that the lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts soon cometh upon all nations, yea, upon every one, yea, upon the proud and lofty, and upon every one who is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. The answer there, the match, is L. Pride. This is perhaps one of Satan's most underestimated, yet powerful, attacks. He gets to our sense of pride. A feeling that we know better. The feeling that we are better than others. Or that we don't need God because we understand things better than those that believe in him or the gospel. You may remember Ezra Taft Benson's famous talk, oft quoted, entitled, Beware of Pride, where he said that pride affects all of us at various times and in various degrees. Pride is the universal sin, the great vice. Oh, we, we need to be careful of pride in the last days. Uh, that talk would be a great one to review. Second Nephi 13 verses 1 through 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Now this is where he's a little harder to understand, but he's saying God's going to take away what the people have been relying on. What's their stay? And what have they been staying on? The mighty man, the man of war the judge, and the prophet, and in that case it means the false prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, 
or the successful man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. So who are they relying on? Not God. Now, our answer here is D, relying on man instead of God. Do we have a problem with that today? Yeah, yeah. Are we looking to the celebrities? Are we looking to uh, the politicians, right? the eloquent orators, the honorable men, the successful? And is that where we're getting our stay? Or are we turning to God? Second Nephi chapter 13, verse 5. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable? The answer is E, persecution and disrespect. Is that a problem nowadays? I'll let you decide. 2 Nephi 13, 14 through 15. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard and the spoil of the poor in your houses. What mean ye? Ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. That's a pretty intense image there, grinding the faces of the poor. The answer is A, taking advantage of the poor. Problem in our day? Yeah. Do, do we ignore the poor? Do we condemn the poor? Do we do nothing to help the poor? Second Nephi chapter 13, verses 16 through 24. Now, I know that's a big chunk of scripture, but it really is an interesting one. I'm going to try to help you here as we, as we go through it. And I know that, that this may seem directed at women, but I think this idea, the, the overall problem, applies to both sexes. This is not just a daughters of Zion kind of problem. And, and Isaiah is going to mention a problem with the sons of Zion in the following verses. So we're going to take a look at that, too, before we move on. But here's how he describes the daughters of Zion. Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Okay, so can you see how he's describing them? Do you, do you envision that, the way that they're walking, taking mincing? or small little steps, and they're stretching forth their necks, and wanton eyes are seductive eyes. So they're definitely playing up their sensuality. Is that a problem in our day? Does our society and culture celebrate and focus on the inherent value and character of women? Or does it celebrate their sensuality? Just look at most movies, music videos, magazine covers. You'd think that in our modern post-feminist movement society that we would have gotten past that a little bit. It doesn't seem like we've made a ton of progress in that area. Therefore, the Lord will smite with the scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion and the Lord will discover their secret parts. And that just means that they're not going to be able to hide their sins anymore. And in that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments and calls and round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen, the hoods and the veils. Now, that's a, that's a really long list of things, isn't it? And to me, the key word here is bravery. This list of things is what's giving them a sense of superiority, pride, self-worth, and they're getting their bravery from their ornaments, their, their chains, their 
bracelets, all those things, which I know some of those things are hard to understand. It almost sounds like he's describing uh, uh, car parts, but, but really each of these are uh, things that the women would wear, right? They're jewelry or clothing. And look how long that list is. He, he's doing this on purpose, Isaiah. He wants you to almost get exasperated with that list. Look at what you have to have in order to be considered beautiful or of worth. You've got to have the right look. It's all about the outward appearance, the way you dress, the things that you have. And really, there's no end to that list in the world. And it might be kind of fun if you stop to think about it. What would our list look like? Is there a list of things that we would come up with that women feel they need to have in order to be considered beautiful or what men need to have or look like in order to be considered of worth or valuable? How much money they have to spend, uh, what they look like on the outside. The idea is that there is an exact look that we have to, to achieve. Uh, the answer here, the match would be B obsessed with having the right look, or the idea that outward appearance is everything. Is this a problem for both men and women in our day? I would point to the social media phenomenon, where everything really is about the outward appearance in a lot of ways. Obsessed with having the look and being liked and viewed by everybody else. Now, I know that that portion is, is focused on the daughters of Zion, but he does say, Isaiah here, something about the men. Look in verses 25 and 26 of that same chapter. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate, and shall sit upon the ground. And then we're going to jump down to verse 1 of chapter 14. There really shouldn't be a chapter break right there. Verse 1 is continuing the thought of verses 25 and 26. It starts with the word and. It's continuing the thought. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, that isn't a reference to polygamy. The reason seven women are taking hold of one man is because so many of the men are dead. They've been slain in battle. So there's not enough men for the women to marry. If we're looking at this spiritually as a commentary on the latter days, likening the scriptures to ourselves, the message is these poor women can't get married because there just aren't enough righteous men to go around. It's going to be hard to find a good man in the latter days because so many of them have been slain spiritually. They're spiritual casualties by the adversary. They've fallen by Satan's attacks, right, his swords. So both the men, the daughters of Zion, and the sons of Zion have got problems in the latter days, he's saying. Second Nephi 15, 11 through 12, and then I include verse 22. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, and wine inflame them, and the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and pipe, and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. And then 22. Woe unto the mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. The answer is C. Drinking and party. Is that a problem in our day? Yes, I think so. In fact, I've been amazed. I've done a lot of traveling in the world. And it does seem that in almost every culture that I've been in, how do people relax? How do most adults have fun? They, they get together and drink and party uh, and, and get drunk. Right? That, that seems to be the way that a lot of individuals in our world Relax, I guess. Second Nephi fifteen eighteen. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, 
and sin, as it were, with a cart rope? The answer is G. The problem here is that they have sins, but they're not trying to hide them. They're open and proud of their sins, drawing or pulling their iniquities behind them with cords of vanity. Their sins with a cart rope. Like they've got their sins in a big cart behind them and pulling them around for everyone to see. It's one thing to commit sin and be ashamed of it, and try to hide it. But I think that we've entered into a deeper phase of iniquity when we begin to sin openly or exhibit pride in our sins, wear them as a badge of honor. Like, like the guy in the locker room bragging about his sexual exploits to everyone. 2 Nephi 15.20 Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is one of Satan's most deceptive tactics and one that is the most in our face. He takes the good things and makes them seem bad. And then he takes the bad things and sets them up as things that are good. I mean, just look at the media these days. I mean, is this a problem in our day? What kinds of things are glorified? What is often set up as good? What movies are the ones that often get all the awards? And then what kinds of things are often mocked, put down, considered childish? Satan is really, really good at switching things on us. So the answer is I, calling good evil and evil good. 2 Nephi 15, 21. Woe unto the wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Answer is J. Learned, but not wise. Jacob warned us that of that back in chapter 9. Problem in our day? Is there a problem with we getting so intellectual, we think we're so smart, that we can ignore religion, faith, the things of God? 2 Nephi 15.24 Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, their root shall be rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And this might just be the root problem for all of the others. They despise the commandments of God and the gospel. The answer is H. Problem in our day? How well are we doing at keeping the commandments? Even just the 10, <laughs> the 10 original commandments. Maybe just go through each one of those 10 and ask yourself, how are we doing as a country or as a world at keeping the Sabbath day holy, not putting other things before God? How are we doing at honesty, morality, covetousness? You can give your nation a grade on how you think we're doing. So I think we've pretty much shown that Satan is still using the same attacks today. The same attacks that he's been using on mankind for millennia. You can probably figure out why. They work. <laughs> he's a great spiritual chess player, and he knows the moves and the attacks that are the most effective. A class discussion question, then, with an answer that seems painfully obvious, but it's worth highlighting. Why do you think the Lord would want us to see all the ways that Satan was tempting people in the past? Why does he spend all those chapters showing all the problems, spiritual problems that these people had? I think it's so that we will know how to defend ourselves from those same attacks, so that we'll be prepared for them. It makes a lot of sense to study and know Satan's tactics. The better you know your opponent, the less likely you're going to be fooled by it. When football teams prepare to play their opponents, they, they watch film of the other team and how they play. We need to do the same kind of thing. And the scriptures are one of the greatest places to see how Satan works. So that we'll know what to look for. So we'll be ready. Ah, those are the things that worked against Isaiah's people. And, and look what happened to them. I'm not going to let Satan fool me in the same way that he fooled them. Or with the Book of Mormon, I, I see how 
the adversary was able to deceive Laman and Lemuel. And look what happened to them. I'm not going to let the same thing happen to me. You won't be fooled. Our truth then, Satan uses many different methods to draw people away from God. The more aware we are of these methods, the better we will be able to resist them. So my friends, beware the attack. Know your enemy. Understand how he works and be ready for him. Because he's coming after us. And he's a formidable opponent. Don't underestimate the adversary. He's won a lot of matches against other people. But he's not invincible. Right? We can beat him if we're prepared. Which leads us naturally into our next lesson, which forms the second part of our strategy, our defense. More than just knowing the attacks, we've also got to be prepared to defend ourselves from those attacks. And thankfully, we do have a defense available to us. God has provided us with holy places of safety. And for an object to this portion of the lesson, you don't necessarily need to have anything. You could just continue to refer to the chessboard. But if you wanted to highlight this particular portion of the lesson, I've got a few additional suggestions. We've got a lot of Legos in our house, and so I would probably just bring in a Lego castle that my son and I built and place it at the front of the class to highlight this idea of defense. But Legos are far too expensive to just go out and buy a big set and put together for just one lesson. So you may just want to display a picture of a castle. Or you could bring in an umbrella or a sunshade of some sort. And you'll see later in the lesson where those objects are going to come into play. Simple icebreaker here. There's a phrase from the Doctrine and Covenants that comes to mind for me whenever I think about our defensive strategy as a church or as disciples of Christ. And it's just a word unscramble. They need to figure out the phrase by unscrambling each word in that phrase. And if you feel that they need some help, you can direct them to Doctrine and Covenants 87 and tell them that the phrase is found in that section somewhere. And it's a shorter section. And what's our phrase? Stand ye in holy places and be not moved. That's from Doctrine and Covenants 87, verse 8. Isaiah is going to teach us what those holy places are. There are three. Three holy places of defense, main ones. Can you find them? in 2 Nephi 14, verses 5 through 6. And look, in these verses, he even uses our word there, defense, in verse 5. But can you find the three holy places of defense? In verse 4, every dwelling place of Mount Zion, our homes, our dwelling places are our homes. Also in verse 4, her assemblies, any place where saints assemble themselves together. So our churches, right? our stakes, branches, seminaries and institutes, the conference center, or any time two or more gather together in God's name. Assemblies. And then third, in verse five, a tabernacle. Now, now what's our modern day tabernacle? It's the temple, right? The tabernacle in biblical times was a temple. So those are our three holy places of defense. Our homes, our churches, our temples. And, and what does God promise he'll provide on each one of those places in verse 4? A cloud of smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. That's, does that sound familiar to anybody? Has God ever done that kind of thing before? Yeah, remember the Old Testament during the Exodus. God placed a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night over the tabernacle, the temple. Now, what does that suggest? Could mean a lot of things. The warmth, the light, and comfort that God's protection offers us. The fire, the smoke. Also, another idea, if you drove by somebody's home at night and you saw all the lights on, or during the day you were driving by in the winter and you saw smoke coming out of the chimney, 
What would you assume about that home? Both images suggest that somebody is there. Somebody is in the house. Their home. Well, that symbol suggests that somebody is home in each of these places. The Lord. He's always there. He's always ready to welcome us. Now, to an early Israelite, like Nephi and his family, that's a really astonishing promise. In the latter days, that blessing and that protection isn't just going to be on the temples, but upon every assembly and every home of Mount Zion. Probably because we're going to need that extra protection and blessing in these difficult and spiritually hazardous last days. And then Isaiah is going to add more symbolic description to the blessings of these defenses in verse 6. And yes, I understand that these verses, or this verse, specifically refers to the tabernacle or the temple, but I believe they apply to all three holy places. He compares them to what three things? A shadow from the heat, a place of refuge, and a covert from storm and from rain. So that's where those objects might be pulled out now. Uh, an umbrella, our little castle, that's a, a place of refuge, or a sunshade. But do you get what he's saying about these promises? He's saying that life is like a heat wave, and we're going to need some shade. It's 115 degrees and we're thirsty. So he calls for us. Come in, cool, cool off, be refreshed in these places, these holy places and drink from my stream. Or life is like a battle, and we're going to need a refuge. So here we are in the world, day by day, at school, the workplace, amongst our peers, and we're swinging our swords, fighting evil. And at times the Lord calls, come home for a moment. Come to my refuge. You can put your sword down for just a while. There's no battles to be fought here. Your enemies can't reach you in here. So rest. And then you can go back out and fight your battles of life with more strength. Or life is like a terrible storm. We're going to need some shelter. A hurricane is moving in. And the Lord says, come, dry off. Find shelter in here. Sit by the warmth of my fire and be cheered. The storm can do no damage to you. And our holy places can provide that for us. And to take this idea more to heart, perhaps a quick sharing activity. Pick one of the three holy places and one of the three symbols that we just discussed and then share how that place has been like one of those things for you. Complete the sentence. The home, church, or temple is like a shadow, a place of refuge, or a shelter from the storm to me because, then fill in the blank. An example, I lived in Arizona for 15 years, and so I know what heat is like. And sometimes in the summer, I would still have to go out and mow my lawn. And what was it like to get out of that 115 degree weather and sit in the shade with a glass of water or run inside to the air conditioning? Oh, it always felt so good. It felt good to get out of the heat. Spiritually, that's what the temple is like for me. It's the exact same feeling. To get out of the heat of the world and find spiritual refreshment and renewal. Well, speaking of the temple, continuation of this thought, let's take a quick look at 2 Nephi 12 verses 1 through 5 and examine the most holy of holy places. Isaiah has something that he wants us to understand about the Lord's house, the temple. In these verses, what object does the Lord compare the temple to? Can you see it? A mountain. How is the temple like a mountain? That's a great discussion question for a class. In my experience, it always yields great answers. They're beautiful, bring you closer to God. They give you a higher perspective. Uh, the problems of the world down below become a whole lot smaller. They require climbing or effort. 
worthiness. Uh, there's plenty of great insights to be garnered from that metaphor. Your students are sure to come up with some really powerful ones on their own. And an additional search to perform here. Look in verses 3 through 5 and mark as many blessings that the temple can bring us as you can find. And what I see, he will teach us of his ways there. The temple's a house of learning, the Lord's university. Much can be learned from the ordinances and covenants and ceremonies that are performed there. We will walk in his paths. The covenant path back to the presence of God passes directly through the temple. Making covenants and worshiping in the temple is walking in his paths. God's laws and words are taught in the temple. Verse 4 suggests that the temple will be a source of peace in the world. And verse 5 suggests that the temple is a place of light. Other words synonymous with light in the scriptures? Truth, spirit, intelligence, and glory. The temple helps us to walk in the light of the Lord. So, taking it to heart, when have you seen the temple bring one of those blessings to you? Our truth, if I stand in holy places, homes, churches, temples, then I will find refuge from Satan's attacks. I love that word, stand, in our scriptural phrase. Stand in holy places. I believe that stand, in that case, is an active word, not a passive one. Like Custer's last stand wasn't an event where he passively sat there waiting to be defeated. It was his last fight. We need to fight in this battle. That word suggests determination, tenacity. When God asks us to stand in holy places, I don't think he meant for us to cower or hide in them. He meant for us to make a stand for our beliefs and, and our standards actively. President Hinckley once wrote a little book called Standing for Something. So we're going to need to stand for something if we wish to withstand the evil day. And, and that stand is going to be in our homes, our churches, and our temples. He that stands for nothing will fall for anything. A quote sometimes attributed to Alexander Hamilton. If we are going to survive the attack of the adversary, then hopefully we will stand in our holy places of defense. So, yes, it's true. Sometimes the best offense is a good defense. But we are also going to need to come out of our holy places and into the world. We aren't meant to just hunker down in our defenses and hope the enemy doesn't get through. God also has an offense. There is a way that we get to fight back against Satan's kingdom. For an object to this final lesson, I would see if I could get my hands on a missionary name tag. But I wouldn't pull it out just yet. I would save that for a key portion in the lesson. For an icebreaker, another simple activity. I'm going to show you some pictures, and I just want you to tell me what words or emotions come to mind when you see them. So I'd have my students do this activity while I showed the picture. So we have a large waving flag on the top of a hill. What words come to mind? What emotions? An archer with his bow bent back, ready to let an arrow fly. A chariot with four horses racing around a track. And then finally, a lion roaring. No right or wrong answers to this activity. Isaiah, we know, was a very visual writer. He uses images or pictures to convey meaning and evoke emotions in us. Let's see how he uses those images and others to help us understand our offensive attack against the adversary. Isaiah is going to describe that offensive attack in 2 Nephi chapter 15, verses 26 through 30. Very visual and symbolic. I'm going to read it to you and see if you can figure out what he's talking about. As a teacher, this is how I would approach it. I, I would read this section to my students, giving them some commentary as I go, 
explaining some of the more difficult words and phrases to help them interpret it. But have them wait to give their guesses until the end of all of the verses you've read. So verse 26, And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far. An ensign is a flag. So, somebody lifting up a huge flag for all the world to see. And will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. Hiss here means to whistle. So the flag bearer lets out a loud whistle. You know, like how some people can put their fingers in their mouths and whistle really loud. I've always wished that I could do that. I've never been able to figure it out. But he whistles. And what happens after he's raised the flag and whistled? And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. So who comes? They come. And who are they? That's what we're trying to figure out. But they come quickly. They're strong. They're enthusiastic. They're there not stumbling or weary. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. They're prepared. They're ready, alert. Their belts are cinched up and their shoes are tied. Whose arrows shall be sharp and all their bows bent. They're archers. Their arrows are sharp. But to have your bow bent means it's pulled back, just ready to let an arrow fly. So this is an army we're talking about. God's army. Who are they? And their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. They're archers on chariots. So they're coming quickly, unstoppable, powerful. If you've ever seen the chariot race in Ben-Hur, that's the imagery here. Can you imagine thousands of those four-horsed chariots racing towards you? How would that make you feel? And then one of my favorite descriptions of this army. They're roaring like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry away safe. And none shall deliver. They're like lions. They roar their message. And they lay hold of the prey and carry it away, not to devour it, but to carry it away safe, never to get away again. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if they look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. So they're, they're going to have to fight and roar during some dark times. So did you figure it out? What army is being described here? Who are these archers with sharp arrows and these roaring young lions? They're missionaries, right? And at that point, I would pull out the missionary name tag. Young men, young women, senior missionaries, couples, and all members who seek to spread the message of the gospel and gather Israel. Isn't that just the coolest description of missionaries you've ever heard? So the prophet stands up on the hill and raises this flag and whistles and says, Come, all worthy, able individuals. Come fight for the Lord. Come join his army. And they come with speed swiftly. Right now they're coming 62,000 strong. And they're powerful unstoppable, effective, like 62,000 chariot archers racing towards you. And they're sent throughout all the world to fight against Satan's kingdom. This is our offense. And we beat him by winning souls to our side, by carrying them away safe. That's our attack, saving souls. And so our personal question here, taking it to heart, becomes, what kind of missionary will you be? This is, this is so great. Then you can just start listing the metaphors. Each one has its own power and impact. Are we going to be come with speed swiftly missionaries? Girdle cinched, shoe latchet tied missionaries? Are we arrows sharp and bows bent missionaries? 
I, I really love that last image. What is a missionary's arrow, do you think? A testimony, right? Is our testimony sharp? Is it ready to fly at a moment's notice? Like you see an investigator across the way and out comes your arrow and you just pull that bow back and, and, and they're like, oh, baptize me, please. <laughs> your testimony went straight to my heart. Are we roaring lion missionaries? That's another great one. Missionaries are lions. They're powerful. They roar the gospel. They don't meow it. Their message is clear. It's loud. It's forceful. I love that. Maybe we shouldn't ask people where they served their missions, but where they roared. I roared in Brazil. My wife roared in Australia. My brothers roared in Peru and Portugal. And my sister roared in Taiwan. Where will you roar? Maybe right there in your own community, on your own street. The Lord needs archers. He needs his young lions. Are we going to answer the whistle? Are we going to flock to the ensign? I, I hope we will. Speaking of mission calls, that's the theme of the next chapter. This chapter describes Isaiah's mission call. And I wish we had a little more time to spend here, but just really quickly, look for what it teaches you about answering the call when it comes. Isaiah at first says, Woe is unto me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah doesn't feel worthy. He doesn't feel ready for this call. That's a common fear amongst many prospective missionaries, amongst anybody who, who wants to serve. We, we always don't feel ready. We don't feel able to do this great work. So what does the Lord do? He sends an angel to him with a live coal and places it on his lips. Can you just hear the sound that that makes? <laughs> I don't know. I could picture that. And the angel says, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin purged. He cleanses him, makes him worthy. I believe that the Lord will do that for all prospective missionaries that desire to serve him, but who maybe have some fears and insecurities. Whom God calls, God qualifies. He will give you the lips that are able to do his work. And then the Lord asks his question again, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And how does Isaiah answer now? Here am I. Send me. I want to go. Just feel the enthusiasm in his response. That's the kind of missionary the Lord needs. He needs, here am I. Send me missionaries. Not, not okay, I'll go if I have to. I'll, I'll go to make others happy. I'll, I'll try to invite people to church so I don't feel guilty kind of missionaries. But here am I, send me, I'm ready, I'm willing, I'm excited to serve and gather Israel. Our truth then, the way to defeat Satan's kingdom is to win souls to Christ through missionary work. Our missionary force, which includes all members of the church, that's our offense. Isaiah has just given us what I consider to be one of the most inspiring visuals for missionary work anywhere in the standard works. So let's roar. Let's fight. Let's flock to the ensign. Let's shout, here am I, send me. And win this battle for the souls of men and women everywhere. That's going to conclude uh, this week's study of the Isaiah chapters. But wait, there's more. Right? Next week, we are going to finish the Isaiah chapters and continue this theme as we begin to look at the winners and the losers in this great final battle. So uh, I pray that you'll join me again next week uh, as we study the scriptures together. Thank you for spending this time with me. I, I hope it's blessed you. I hope it's helped you in some way. If it has, I encourage you to share it with somebody else that you feel it can help. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach 
with power.